and welcome to The Curling Show, the podcast that brings you interviews with the sports top athletes and the people who shape the game. I'm Dean Gemmel, and in this edition, we talked with a curler who just got his mitts on the Tim Hortons McDonald Briar tankard. The white belt wearing and the 2007 Tim Hortons Briar winning Richard Hart. Welcome back to The Curling Show. Thanks, Dean. Yeah. Hey, first of all, congratulations, of course, on the win in Hamilton. Taking nothing away from Brad Gushu, but I think your win was a popular one with fans. As Brian McAndrew in the Toronto Star said, the good guys finally won. Uh, again, though, considering the number of finals, your very talented group of curlers has actually lost over the years, either as a team or with other teams. Would you have started to think there were mysterious forces working against you guys if you hadn't won? <laughs> well, I don't know about that, Dean, but, you, you know, you're right. Uh, we have had lots of opportunity over the years, and uh, you know what? All you can do is just keep putting yourself into that position, and, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, good things happen. And, you know, I think that's important. That, you know, that I had Russ, on a, Russ Howard on a while ago, and he talked about the number of finals he's lost, and, and people don't realize that the best curlers are in position all the time. It doesn't mean you're always going to come out on top. Yeah, that's right. Like, I think, I'm not sure, but I think Russ has lost five Briar finals. Glenn, with last year, that was his sixth, I think. And, and Russ uh, also said he lost six provincial finals. So. Yeah, that's right. You know, so I thought I had a lot with, uh, what is it, Four, I've lost, or five, maybe. I can't even remember anymore. You just count the wins now, Dean. Well, yeah, you got to be in it to win it, though, right? <laughs> That's right, absolutely. You know, this year you guys actually lost the 1 2 page game. Uh, I know Glenn doesn't like the page system. Maybe this year it felt like uh, that made you guys a team of destiny lo- losing that game. But what format would you prefer to see? Yeah, well, I mean, recognize that, uh, you know, you have to have a final, and I mean, that's exciting stuff for the fans to watch. I mean, uh, a uh, sudden death game is uh, is always the most exciting part of curling. None of us on the team are big fans of the one two. It just seems it, it takes away from the round robin. I mean, the round robin you play all week long, and uh, you, you know uh, the winner of the round robin because of that. If you win the round robin, I mean, you used to win the briar if you win the round robin. But right. uh, and I understand why you, you know we can't have that anymore. But more emphasis should be placed on it, and and uh, uh, you know the the bye to the final is seems justified. I mean, it seems like they could have another format with the buy of the final for the round robin winner and still get the number of games they want for TV. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, most of the top curlers understand that uh, it's important to sell our game, and, and TV is an important part of it, and as are our fans. But it just it just does still even taking that into consideration, it just doesn't quite seem right to me. So, uh, but anyway, you, you get you, there's. You know, it worked for you this year, though, right? Absolutely, yeah. Hey, during the final, your whole team seemed uh, maybe more on edge than I've ever seen before. Savile and Lang were urging each other on as they swept, and Glenn seemed to have even more intensity than he usually does. Uh, you seem to keep up your usual light banter. Um, how much of that commentary during a game is natural, and how much of it is part of your effort to keep everyone loose? Oh, good question. Yeah, you know, I haven't watched the game yet, but I've, I've heard lots of comments, and, and, you know, that's the way we, we've we play every game, so you know you just try to do the same things, even even when you're in a big game. And uh, so I didn't uh, I didn't make an effort to, to do it more so in the final, that's for sure. But it, it you know it sort of works for us. We got a, a great team chemistry on the ice. Uh, we we try to you know goof around and we try to make light of uh, you know bad situations when you're in them because they happen, and it you know it tends to help us get through them. Hey, let's talk about two shots in the game. First, the shot Brad called with his last in the seventh. Would you have played it? Um, no, definitely I wouldn't have. Um, but then again, that's not really my shot. So, uh, but, but no, definitely would not have played that shot. No. It looked to me like he slid inside, but he said it picked. What did it look like from the other end? <laughs> uh, it looked to me like he slid inside also. Again, I haven't seen the tape, but I, I've heard many comments from people that they... You know, they thought he, you know, he, he was tight of the broom as well, that, you know, the rock actually never really leaves the center line. But uh, that, that, there was lots of picks all week, so For sure. it, could have, it could have picked in his hand and sort of dragged his whole slide off, right. off as well. I mean, I, I wouldn't rule that out as well, you know. But it was definitely when it was let go, it was on the guard. Hey, the shot in nine that you guys played, you and Glenn initially called a different shot, but um, it sort of speaks volumes about the way your team operates, maybe a little more democratic than a lot of teams. The guys at the front end said, hey, look at this other shot. Did you guys just, you didn't see how far he'd come out the other side? You're right. We do operate quite differently than a lot of teams. I had seen it, but I, to be honest with you, uh, I didn't think that Glenn would really be interested in it, and that's why we didn't really bring it up. And, and sometimes uh, Glenn was really leaning towards taking one, and I was really pushing hard for making a play for, for three, you know, in any, in any way we, we could, you know. 
So when they went down and he got a look at it from the hack, I think, and the guys said to him, said, hey, look, we got a quarter rock out here. Why don't we, why don't we make a play wide on it? And, uh, you know, they did a pretty good sales pitch on Glenn, I think, and, uh, and thank, you know, thank goodness but, you know, that Glenn made that decision. And, uh, you know, obviously he made a fantastic shot. Um, but, uh, yeah, our team operates a little differently for sure. Well, you know, it's good to see. I mean, I think there's a, there's a model there that other teams could work from. Glenn certainly seems to be in charge, but he's willing to listen. Yeah, I think you're right about that. It's more it's more a tribute to Glenn than it is to the the whole team. I mean, a lot of skips don't want to hear that kind of stuff, but but Glenn is able to uh, sort of take it all in and evaluate everything, and then just sort of make that decision whichever one you know he, he feels most comfortable with. So it's really a tribute to him uh, more so than the whole team. You know, after the game, you mentioned uh, as the rock was coming down, you, you, your thoughts were finally, we, you know, this is we're going to get this done. You also mentioned the uh, '98 loss in, in Nagano, and I was surprised to hear how much that still weighs on you. Is that uh, you just it, that's one that still turns your stomach a bit, I guess? Yeah, well, um, for sure. I mean, that that that's something that sort of sticks with you. I mean, that that week uh, in Nagano. Again, we felt like we were the best team, and uh, and we played well all week, and and really sort of went through the round robin and even the semifinal, untouched, if you will. And um, you know, we we caught a, a horrible break with Mike getting sick and and not being at his best. And you know, obviously, you know, there's there's no hard feelings about it, other than you just wish it was different. It was just again one of those things in sport and one of those things in curling that. It was sort of out of your control, and that's a frustrating thing. So uh, I'm really, you know what, I think it, uh, it, it's going to help to drive me a lot in, in Edmonton, not that, you know, I need extra help. I mean, I think we're all really motivated to go up there and try to win the championship. Speaking about the Olympics and Mike and his, his illness, I guess you know more than anyone else uh, acutely what how important the alternate can be in international play. Uh, you guys had Steve Weiss, who filled in for you in the provincial final at the Briar, which was a real classy gesture, I thought, on your part. Yeah, but uh, there's some other players you could take as alternates to the world. It's a pretty good player out in New Brunswick who Glenn seems to know pretty well. Uh, <laughs> any thoughts on who you might take? Yeah, we we've made the decision, and uh, we definitely considered uh, all those options for sure. Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go with what got us there. Steve's coming with us to the world. We did talk a lot about uh, some other options. Um, but at the end of the day, you know what? Um, you're more concerned about uh, the, one of the most important things is chemistry on a team, and uh, to upset that um, and bring in a different person and not really know what it's going to do to your team is a big risk. And to make that risk, you know, with you know the potential that really, you know, the, the chance, you know, hopefully the chances are you're you're not going to need that person, and the person's not going to play. You know, 98 percent of the time that that doesn't happen. Uh, interesting choice of numbers, I guess. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> but so, so it's a big risk to bring in another person for a very, very small chance that you're going to need them. So, you know, we're going to go with what got us there. Well, the Steve Vice story is a great one. So, uh, well, I hope to, you know it's interesting to see it continue. So, yeah, yeah, he's fit in great with the team, and I, I think uh, I think the kid's uh, having a, the time of his life. And he, when we called him, uh, obviously he was uh, very excited and and uh, is really looking forward to Edmonton and. To be honest, I hope this really helps to kickstart his career. That maybe he can sort of see, you know, what what is at the end of the rainbow, and and uh, see what you know some of the the top teams do, and maybe it'll help him with uh, his, his curling in the future. Yeah, an invaluable experience for sure. Yeah, I know Hamilton will be your favorite Briar for a while, but it was a strange <laughs> week, and perhaps the strangest aspect was the multitude of theories on what was causing the high number of picks. We heard just about everything from the pebble wearing down to shoddy equipment to Ian handprints to Stephen Harper to exploding rocks. Uh, to me, some picks did look like flat spots, and then at other times, like that time when it looked like Al Harnden was trying to lob the rock to the other end, uh, it <laughs> did look like debris. Uh, everyone else has weighed in. Rich, what's your theory? Oh, man. It's, uh, it's a combination of a few things, really. I mean, um, there was a few of the games, there was more debris on the ice than there should have been. Um, I will say that. But uh, we play in arenas all across the country all year long. You know it, what's different about Cops Coliseum? Who knows? I mean, it, it, I don't think it was any there was any more dirt in the arena than any other arena we go to, so that can't be it. It can't be the rocks because we use those rocks in other arenas. I've played with them four or five times. You didn't see dust rocks. exploding off them, right? <laughs> you do actually see it. There was some dust you could see, but really? that had nothing to do with with anything. Um, it's the same curlers, so I mean, there's the same flat spots and 
shoe prints. I mean, that's all the same every week in and week out. It's the same guys playing with the same equipment. So to me, it uh, and it was admitted, I guess, by the ice crew that they did have trouble with the water. Yeah, with the jet ice pro. Yeah, jet ice and uh, so that was definitely a factor, and it definitely improved after they made that change. Right. So that tells me that 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 was the problem, and uh, you know they made the adjustment, but maybe that adjustment was just a little too late to totally get rid of the problem. But uh, I know that, you know, I've heard things from fans, well, we don't care, blah, blah, blah. Well, it, to a curler, it's just massive. To have a rock pick and, and go off the sheet is, you know, this uncontrollable thing that comes into curling, and it's just uh, it's the most horrible thing about the whole game of curling, to be honest with you. Well, and, and, and for your team, I mean, you guys were on the wrong side of it and the right side of it a couple yeah, times. So I think, yeah. it, I think it evened out, fortunately, in the end for everybody. Yeah, it does, but it still doesn't take the frustration away. I no. mean, you want the game. I mean, it is a part of the game, but you want it to come down to skill. And uh, and unfortunately, you know, it, it doesn't uh, when, when that, that kind of stuff happens. So, it, it really uh, did seem to make guys more concerned about having to draw the forefoot to win and things like that. Oh, for, it changes your shot selection around. Absolutely. I mean, I, earlier in the week when it was bad... We, there's no way we would even call a draw to the forefoot to win a game. You know, right. it was just, uh, you, you couldn't play that shot. And because um, there was a 50% chance it would pick, especially late in the games, extra end games. You know, it, it didn't happen. We won a game, we stole the 10th end, or the extra end against Stoughton, and his rock didn't pick. I mean, he underthrew it. But um, <laughs> if, if, he did, if he wasn't light, it probably would have picked. Who knows? I mean, it was just such a, you know, a horrible situation to have to draw late in the game. Hey, there's a big difference between first and second at the Tim Hortons Briar. Lots of extra gravy for the winner. For you, what's most important? Uh, well, the name on the trophy. I mean, uh, you know, from now on, I mean, we'll be uh, we'll be forever uh, Briar champions and former Briar champions. So uh, that that's the most important thing for sure. I mean, there's also the trial spot and things like that, though, right? That uh, certainly uh, make yeah, the next I know. Few years. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that's a big part, sure, but. Um, you know what? I mean, that's three, four years away, and and that's a long-term goal of our teams. But that's not something that I, you know, I'm focused on right now. I mean, our focus this year was to uh, come out and win uh, win some Grand Slams, which we did, and uh, and then also was to uh, make it back to the Briar and win that Briar, and and we've done that. So now we've got to set our goal of winning the Worlds, and uh, th- and that's what, that's what we're doing right now for the next uh, for the next few weeks until Edmonton comes around. Hey, let's talk quickly about another event you're not in right now, the Strauss Canada Cup. Uh, what do you think about that event? Well, it's a great event. I mean, uh, it, the, the curlers love to love to play in it, and uh, they have a great purse out there. You know, it, from where I live, it's hard to get to. That's the one thing for sure. And then the scheduling of it this year really was uh, didn't work out very well. I think for for, a for lot almost of teams. all curlers, really. So yeah. that, that was unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, it's too bad because, you know, to me it just seems like a, a non-event and it's uh, right after the Briar and I think people get burned out as fans. And I don't know, it seems to me that CCA might find uh, better use of the Strauss people's money, but maybe they want to torture us with some more of those commercials or something. I don't know, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, I love to like see... Commercials, but I think the CCA actually, they're, uh, they're looking into that for sure. They, they want to find a date in the schedule that, uh, that works. It's really difficult, eh? You know, January, February, and March are so busy with playdowns maybe it's an event that would be better suited for um you know earlier in the season yeah, I mean, right now it butts up against the asham world curling tour and the national in port hawkesbury i mean right uh, right i mean there's a lot going on right now i would say that early you know early december would be a great time for it and and then every third year maybe you don't do it you know the year you do the olympic trials well, I, you know what I say, Rich? I say they take the money from Strauss and they put it to grassroots things and they let the Asham World Curling Tour run cash bills. Run cash bills. Well, that's one theory, but you know what? I, I think it's a great event and there's definitely room for it. So I think uh, it's just a matter of scheduling. And uh, and I know the people in Kamloops love that event. They support it. And, uh, you know, I don't want to see it go away, that's for sure. I just want to find We've got to find the right place for it. That's right. all. I, I and, don't know. Uh, maybe it's, it's some sort of fifth major, I guess, but I, yeah. don't, I don't know. No, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, it, 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 there's definitely space for it, and I think the qualification should be changed around and do away with these Canada Cup East and West qualifiers, or I guess they got rid of that. Now they're just down to a Canada Cup qualifier spiel. Right. That's a little much. Just go right off the CTRS, or you know, you have your Briar winner get a, get a spot in the previous year and then take the next eight off the CTRS. Yeah. I, I think that would be a, a great way of doing it. Because, you know, I don't think, you know, the CCA is not, doesn't want to be in, you know, running cash deals. And there's another one they have to do, right? Uh, they did the Edmonton one this year and then the one in Ottawa. Right. 
So get away from those, and but keep the Canada Cup. I mean, it's a fantastic event, and the curlers love it, uh, and I know the fans do too. Keep that event, find the right spot, and uh, and I think uh, if they use the CTRS as qualifying, then you you have um, you have the ability to move it to a different spot in the schedule. Well, we'll see what they do with it. They need to do something, anyways. But uh, yeah, for, for hey, sure we finish with the run back, Rich. I give you a topic. Give me your thoughts in one to three words. Okay. Most surprising team at this year's Briar. Uh, Northern Ontario. Hey, Northern Ontario. That Brad Jacobs can throw it pretty well, can he? Oh, sure. I mean, surprising, I think, to a lot of people. They, they beat us earlier in the season. Yeah, so they we beat weren't the all that shorty, surprised. didn't they? Yeah, they did, too. Yeah, yeah, they got us out there pretty good, actually. Hey, the uh, the bit of satire in Sportsnet featuring your team. Yeah, a lot of fun to do, and, and I hope you've seen the full-length version of it. No, I, I've only seen it online, so I don't think that's the full-length no, version. No, there's a four-minute version of it, and it's uh, it's pretty funny stuff. Well, nice performances by you guys, anyways, from what I saw. <laughs> uh, knee prints on the ice. Uh, yeah, frustrating uh, frustrating part of curling. I don't think anybody does it on purpose, though, myself. I think it just, uh, maybe no, you do, it, but no, I don't. No, of course not. And I think we, we've all done it inadvertently, right. for sure. You know, uh, but it's something we all got to you know, do our best to, to uh, avoid, for sure. Number of new notes in Glenn Howard's famous rock book after last week. Anything new? <laughs> Well, uh, no, we had we had a pretty extensive uh, book on those rocks already, and they're they're it, it pretty much as is. Where, where where is the rock book? Where is it kept? Oh, we we uh, we can't, it can't tell be you. disclosed. Yeah, it can't be disclosed. Absolutely, top secret. And finally, the toughest team you'll face in Edmonton. Um, good question. Switzerland, Ralph Stocky. All right, Rich, uh, since the CBC gives you that little scroll, I give everybody a chance to name their sponsors on my show. So, oh, uh, you know, well, actually, thank you very uh, much for that. Steve Bice, we talked to him last show, and I, I actually, he didn't have sponsors, so I mentioned yours. So you're getting two shows in a row. Oh, so fantastic. let me know who sponsors you guys. Team Howard would love to thank um, JVC Canada, the Dominion Insurance of Canada, uh, Balance Plus, and also Hartwell Electrical. Yeah, that's Companies, a good sponsor. Uh, yeah, they're fantastic. And we urge everybody to check out our website, teamglennhoward.com. All right, there you go, Rich. Thanks for your time. It's always a pleasure. Uh, good luck in Edmonton. Thanks very much, Dean. That's Richard Hart on The Curling Show. Just a few things before we wrap up. First, if you're like me and you're in the United States, make sure you sign up for the NBC online coverage of the World Championships. You can find the link at usacurl.org. And whether you watch or not, more people signing up demonstrates demand for curling coverage. Second, since your club may be closed before the last issue of the season arrives, pony up for a subscription to the Curling News and the other hard-working curling print media for that matter. And finally, support the people who make quality equipment for our game and pick up some of their year-end inventory before the season ends. Thanks for listening. <laughs>